Welcome to the Trauma and Pepper podcast, FCRA Focus. I'm Kim Pham, co-host of the podcast. Thank you for joining us today as we welcome our special guests from the Credit Builders Alliance, an innovative national nonprofit network created to provide a bridge to the modern credit reporting system for its members. CBA's platform of services helps shape their members' credit reporting programs by connecting them to the credit bureaus to report loan payments and to pull reports for underwriting and financial coaching. They support practitioners through training and professional development opportunities, and they promote the replication and scale of safe and responsible credit building products and strategies while advocating for consumer-friendly policies at legislative levels and within the credit industry itself. However, before we jump in, let me remind you to visit and subscribe to our blogs, TroutmanPepperFinancialServices.com and ConsumerFinancialServicesLawMonitor.com. And while you're at it, head on over to Troutman.com and add yourself to our Consumer Financial Services email list that allow you to get invitations to our webinars and receive our alerts and advisories that we send out from time to time. And while we make lots of free content available to our listeners, if you cannot get enough FCRA, I would encourage you to explore our subscription-based tracker service, which provides information on federal and state regulatory and legislative developments as well as summaries of FCRA case law on a weekly basis and includes a monthly roundtable discussion. These tracker services can also cover other topics, including debt collection and privacy and data security. Now, today we're going to hear more about the challenges smaller entities may face when beginning the process of credit reporting or their ongoing struggles with compliance. Joining me today are Elizabeth Johnson Crawford, Chief Technical Officer and Aranze Wadiabu, Manager of Cre- Bureau Services. Elizabeth, Arinze, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourselves and the Credit Builders Alliance before we dive into today's topics? Sure. So, hi, I'm Elizabeth Johnson Crawford. I, uh, as you mentioned, Chief Technical Officer here at Credit Builders Alliance, which means I am our local credit reporting nerd. Please don't ask me about the Wi Fi as my go to joke. I've been with Credit Builders Alliance since 2011 and have worked with our members in a wide variety of capacities in the process of helping them set up to report, to maintain reporting, managing disputes, and working with our bureau contacts to maintain this partnership and keep things flowing smoothly to do research on new kinds of services and things like that. And I get to lead our Bureau Services team with my fantastic colleague, Arinzi, here. So, Arinzi, if you'd like to share a little about yourself. Yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for inviting us on the podcast. Really excited to dive a little bit into the uh, FCRA. But yeah, a little bit about myself. I've been with Credit Builders Alliance now for a little over five years. I help manage our Bureau Services department which in a nutshell is helping all our organization members report their loan portfolios over to the credit bureaus and then helping them with their ongoing monthly reporting. So they're submitting their monthly Metro 2 files and helping them with any disputes and account corrections that are needed along the way. So yeah, it's kind of it in a nutshell. Well, thank you for introducing yourselves. And as a self-proclaimed FCRA nerd myself, I love talking to kindred spirits and I'm thrilled to have you here today. Now, first step first, deciding whether or not to credit report is a huge decision for any organization. How do you typically advise your members on the potential benefits that come with credit reporting as well as the potential legal risks when deciding whether or not that credit reporting may make sense for them as an organization? Well, it's sort of built into our name, Credit Builders Alliance. We're pretty pro credit reporting in terms of getting consumers who often otherwise don't have opportunities to have positive information listed on their credit report, giving them the opportunity to build positive credit history with every on-time monthly payment with our lender members. We definitely sit down and talk to anybody who comes to us interested in reporting to talk through what the capacity requirements are, what we've seen work well for our members in the past and what hasn't worked well, what kind of software they're going to need to make sure that they have up front, different trainings that we offer to be able to help better prepare them for the start and to maintain successful ongoing reporting and other resources out there as well, like things like courses and resources through the CDIA, Consumer Data Industry Association, 
directly from our bureau partners, as well as groups like NeighborWorks Training and other sort of more nonprofit focused partners out there. Yeah, I'd just like to add, yeah, that decision with organizations and credit reporting, it's definitely important for them to kind of weigh that those pros and cons. Things like organizations that have people with thin file or are new to credit, they're really going to see an impact and have an opportunity to report on a loan and build credit that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have that opportunity and get that ball rolling. We have organizations that deal with immigrant communities that are coming over and experiencing the American credit system for the first time. And then kind of probably the less talked about other side of it is just the fact that lender, the lender itself, where they can kind of get a whole picture of someone's credit profile and the fact that these trade lines are going to be on the borrower's credit report. So definitely different factors. And then as far as the legal side of it and some of those considerations, we definitely encourage them to reach out to their legal resources and, and counsel to kind of get that full picture so they know what they're going to be looking at short term, medium term and long term. Yeah, those populations obviously would greatly benefit from positive credit history being available about them. But the FCRA doesn't care about laudable intent. It cares about technical compliance. And I understand that many of your members are small entities. So even before they can even begin credit reporting, there has to be this huge investment in capacity, staffing, resources to establish appropriate policies and procedures developing an internal dispute reinvestigation process, implementing monitoring, auditing, and oversight, and many, many more FCRA requirements. I imagine it can be a little bit overwhelming. How would you recommend one of your members get started? I'd say first off, certainly would be starting with the training resources that CBA offers. And with our specific reporting partnership with the bureaus, our members have a lot of built-in support there. So for example, we're working with them at the very beginning to make sure that they are in a good place to successfully complete credit bureau credentialing, as well as working with them to get their initial test data looking good, looking the way it needs to, including all the accounts that it should, and working with the bureau contacts to make sure that they're reading it appropriately and accurately as well. Every month we're reviewing their files to make sure it's it's all logical and then passing it over to the bureau. So we're providing a lot of technical assistance there and quality control and support. Whenever we see issues come up, we're able to provide additional training for them and clarification and encouraging best practices and things like that. And then on the dispute side of things, our arrangements with the bureaus are that we actually manage the disputes for our members. So we get the notification, we work with the member to verify the details and then submit the response back to the bureaus. And through that process, we're able to identify a lot of larger issues that may be happening to help them think through like what are the processes that are in could be introducing errors or introducing confusion on behalf of the consumer who's just a little uncertain about what they're reading on the the credit report or why it's showing up a particular way. And so through that ongoing support, we really do decrease a lot of the capacity requirements that other small furnishers may face outside of CBA's membership, which is specifically nonprofit, government, and tribal entities. And just to add a little bit to that, I think we do a great job ushering organizations through the process of starting with our membership department, figuring out if the timing is going to work out, kind of mapping out what it's going to look like in the short, medium, and long term, and then kind of walking the organization through that process. Some of the resources, while yes, it is daunting through that kind of initial onboarding piece. There are bureau resources that organizations can lean on. There's the credit reporting resource guide and different organizations that can kind of definitely give them that kind of book knowledge, if you will, on all the different requirements and responsibilities. And beyond the book knowledge, we remind our members often that we are not lawyers, unlike our amazing (laughs) host here. And so we can't provide legal advice, but we can share, again, just what's worked for our other members in the past and where we've seen issues come up that they can hopefully avoid. 
Well, Arinzi, you mentioned the credit reporting resource guide. I imagine that is a large topic in these early conversations. Yes. Yeah. The Consumer Data Industry Association, CDIA, which Elizabeth has already mentioned, developed Metro 2, a standard electronic data reporting format for furnishers in the consumer reporting ecosystem. And the credit reporting resource guide is basically the Bible with regard to the Metro 2 standard. And while an incredibly useful tool, Understanding the many nuances in the credit reporting resource guide can be a daunting undertaking for even the most sophisticated players in the industry. So I imagine it, it would result in very common pain points among your members. Do you want to highlight a few for our audience? Yeah, sure. Yeah, like you mentioned, it is a large, oftentimes hard to navigate book and guide. So that in and of itself is, is a challenge. But yeah, like you mentioned, it's really the Bible it does, and not the end-all be-all, but it is a guide. Generally speaking, all the different scenarios that an organization will run into is in their one shape or form. So to answer your question, the, the hardest or the pain points, if you will, for the credit reporting resource guide is just really navigating it for the first time figuring out which parts are applicable to their situations, and then just getting that full understanding when integrating it with their loan management software, right? So you have your loan management software, and then that produces that Metro 2 file, and then kind of leaning back on and connecting the dots between what is in your software and what is in the actual report and being able to understand the two and learn how to how those two things mesh. Yeah, and I would just add on to that, that I think mentioning the loan management software, we know that is often a pain point for these smaller furnishers like our members because they don't have armies of programmers that can develop a unique tailored solution for them. So they're using off-the-shelf systems. So within the universe of nonprofit lenders, there's some really reliable systems out there and we have great relationships with the support teams. And so we're able to work with them to help resolve or avoid bugs, help give them feedback on their programming and how it's potentially impacting the accuracy of the Metro 2 files that our members are generating. Since we can usually see multiple multiple members using the same system and identify you know, what's going to be user error, what's going to be potentially a, a software bug and things like that. Since the liability for the accuracy is all on our members, we are here to help advocate for them with these software vendors to help make sure that they can maintain the accuracy of their data. We know there's a lot of different vendors out there, and I've talked to folks who were full of energy and excitement and eager to start designing software that can produce a Metro 2 and sort of introducing them to the realities of this particular very complex language and sometimes directing them to some alternative solutions rather than having to develop and program all of that out given the huge liability that this creates for any of their users we joke that part of my job is yelling at software vendors, basically, <laughs> on behalf of our members to make sure that their data can come out accurately and, and the way that it should. Yeah, and that's one of the probably the biggest benefits to our reporting members of uh, being members of CBA is just really our staff here are Metro 2 experts, credit reporting resource guide experts, so they definitely can lean on us for those kind of pitfalls that come up. And we can help guide them through any questions they have while giving them the knowledge. So down the line, they can also build their own uh, knowledge going forward. Yeah. And as we all know, third-party relationships can often be a source of risk. And I appreciate that your members probably don't have an army of internal staff to provide the support they need and have to rely on third parties like CBA and third-party software vendors to help with their FCRA compliance. But let me ask you and turn the, the direction of our conversation a little bit. We've talked a lot about what happens on the front end to get some of your members ready. Well, let's talk about the back end. You know, after someone is a, an established furnisher, do you ad offer additional support? And you talked about reviewing to get folks ready with their Metro 2 files and getting accurate files sent on to the credit bureaus. But 
again, assuming that some of your members don't have an internal data analytics team sitting around, I understand that you provide some uh, some additional support on the back end, like root cause analysis and and other support in that area. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? So we work with on um, kind of like over two hundred fifty different reporter members who are yeah about that low <laughs> foreigner should have that number on hand, but who are recording data through us. And one of the benefits we've been able to see is sort of having a single individual on our team being the point person for all of the disputes coming in for a particular member. They can see sometimes patterns that are emerging if the number of disputes ticks up in particular, if the types of dispute codes or the additional comments that come with the disputes are trending in a particular direction. They're already used to that member's queue of disputes. And so they're able to really spot changes that come up. I know there was one of our members who I was working with at one point, and we we really started noticing an uptick in the number of disputes they were getting and which they were responding to correct the information. And through that process, we realized that there was some entry errors for some of their accounts where it was instead of reporting as bi-weekly, or sorry, it was reporting as bi-weekly when it should have been bi-monthly. And so some of the calculations were off and, and showing incorrectly. And going back to the, the previous comment about working with software vendors is I was able to set up a call between them and their software vendor with me on the line as well, so that I could clarify for the vendor, this is the situation we're running into. And so we were able to find a solution for them to move forward and making sure that all the calculations were showing up accurately. You know, I kind of want to make a point that the ongoing support generally and the support that CBA gives is, is super important and really Kind of came like you alluded to the the beginning part is the hardest. The ongoing reporting does get easier. So you know I don't want to like on the on this party like scare away people from from reporting. The ongoing reporting definitely is more of the call it easier. And I also want to kind of say mistakes are going to happen, and then that's part of where CBA also comes in to help our member organizations correct those mistakes, whether that be AUDs, manual corrections, where we contact the Bureau on their behalf, and then also helping them correct any discrepancies within their software and Metro 2 file. So it is a process, but definitely starting off on a strong foot and continuing is is really going to be key. Well, very good. I understand that in addition to credit reporting, I understand that CBA also works with your members in other consumer reporting areas, such as alternative data, rental information. Do you want to tell our audience about some of those other CBA initiatives? Yes, certainly. So CBA has been working in the space of rent reporting for over a decade at this point. We've found different kinds of opportunities to get involved. And what we do primarily these days is supporting rent reporting implementation with training and technical assistance for affordable housing providers around choosing a reporting mechanism, how they're engaging with their residents, how they're managing the program ongoing. We're really able to help provide rent reporting expertise, not only just figuring out the mechanism, but really helping them understand how to engage residents within a more holistic sense of financial empowerment, coaching, education, all of these things wrapped into one so that residents can really make the most impact out of this opportunity to build credit with a payment that they're already making. Additionally, we provide our expertise to both state and national policymakers as they're drafting reporting legislation. We had some successes a couple of years back in California, D.C., and one other state that I've placed. We also work a lot with providers to collect data, collect success stories to really illustrate the positive impact that folks are finding within their, their daily lives, as well as best practices for affordable housing providers to really show how it can be done, how it can make the most impact, what resources are are the most helpful in different parts of the program. We've done a lot of work back in the beginning with groups like HUD to help identify what were the requirements for rent reporting in terms of opt-in versus opt-out and things like, is it should rent reporting 
be using an installment type or an open type based on some of the characteristics specific to affordable housing residents. I just want to give a quick plug to our training institute, what all our members have access to. We have a bunch of resources there that help them throughout either credit reporting, reading and understanding credit reports, and then just some of our core offerings is uh, helping organizations access credit reports. So if they need credit reports to for soft inquiries for credit counseling and coaching, credit reports for hard inquiries to do their underwriting, CBA can help them get discounted reports from the from the bureaus. So I just want to highlight those two. And then another, just a quick blurb about our CDFI intermediary, which is a CBA fund which we do loans and give grants to organizations. And CBA Fund also does some of those loans and grant programs for population-specific products. We have a lot of resources around how to think about credit building in products for folks who may be new to the U.S., folks who may be returning citizens, justice exposed, folks who are are dealing with having some sort of criminal record that may be interfering with their normal ability to pursue their financial goals. We also have resources for assistive technology providers and housing stability, all sorts of things that are, are going to be really specific to hopefully help people get products out there to support their communities. So as we wrap up today, any final recommendations for FCRA compliance strategies and solutions you want to share with our audience or any other closing thoughts? Yeah, thank you. For me, probably the biggest thing is for our member organizations, there definitely is capacity constraints, which we we understand also as being a, a nonprofit, but I would really encourage folks to, to spend that little extra time to kind of do their their homework, do their due diligence, get a copy of the credit reporting resource guide, learn the fundamentals and basics of the their FCRA duties and following that compliance. And then their own individual organizations, policies and procedures, and really honing in on that, tailor it specifically to their organization, their mission, and follow through with that. And then transfer that knowledge and make sure staff that are working on loans or pulling credit reports, things like that, are all aware of those policies and procedures. And then just know that it's not like set in stone. You can also mold it over time. And then to add on to that, I would say that one of the biggest resources that our members have is a positive, trusting relationship with their clients. And so I think for them, that really helps reduce a lot of the compliance costs and burden because their clients know that they can come to them, that they're on their side and to say, help figure out a, an updated repayment schedule if they're in danger of falling behind. So they, they don't even have to be recorded as past due to start with if they can get those modifications in there early enough, being able to respond to the lender directly and asking questions rather than necessarily just submitting dispute after dispute because there's just a miscommunication or misunderstanding. And so our members have a great deal of goodwill with their clients. And I think that really, that positive relationship really does help them avoid some of the more difficult components of some of the, the compliance burden because their clients can come directly to them and they trust them. And so they can just do that interpersonal correction rather than needing to take go through different kinds of channels. Well, that is great to hear. And, and Elizabeth, Orenzi, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please let us know by leaving a review on your podcast platform of choice. And of course, stay tuned for our next episode of this FCRA-focused podcast. Thank you all for listening. Copyright Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders, LLP. 
These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Pepper does not make any representations or warranties, express or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal or other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including, without limitation, reproduction, retransmission or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Pepper. If you have any questions, please contact us at Troutman.com.